This is the Guided Podcast, an interview with the fly fishing industry's top guides and brand ambassadors. On this podcast, we cover topics such as the guiding lifestyle, conservation, different fisheries globally, and gear and technology to improve your game. I'm your show host, Greg Keenan. Before we begin today's show, let's thank our sponsors. Scientific Anglers is the leader in producing the world's best fly lines for over 75 years. Scientific Anglers have set new industry standards with their SA Amplitude family of fly lines, both in technology and performance. See the difference for yourself today at scientificanglers.com. Show your show support and follow us on Instagram at Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. Now let's begin. Welcome to Guided. Today we're speaking with Alice Owlsley from Riverside Anglers. Alice, welcome to the show. Thank you, Greg. Perfect. I'm so glad you're here. I know you, we have a ton of content to uh, to cover. You uh, are a pretty well-known guide out in your area in Montana. Well, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and how you got into fly fishing? I learned how to fly fish as a kid from my dad when I was eight and kept up with it through high school and college. And in college, I, kind of the typical fishing guide story, I was in college, had plans to go into graduate school, and got sidetracked. So one summer, I spent out in Oregon, working at Oregon State University in the forest entomology lab, thinking that's where I was headed for graduate school. I rode my bike to the lab every day so that I could save money for gas and fished as much as I could around Oregon in the, on the weekend and camped. And on my way home, I drove across Montana and spent a week in Montana and was lucky enough to attend at the time the Federation of Fly Fishers annual conclave, which was in Livingston. And I went to tying classes, casting clinics, all sorts of things to learn more about fly fishing and improve my skills and had the realization during that week that I could work in the fishing industry since this was something that I enjoyed. So I headed back to North Carolina and applied for a job at Hunter Banks Company and started working there while in school. That connection in the fly shop put me in contact with a number of different anglers and fishing guides, and I was helping out with casting clinics, did a few walkway trips there in western North Carolina, and then had the opportunity to teach alongside Lorianne Murphy and Patty Riley. And they encouraged me to go to guide school and apply for a job at West since that was something I was interested in. Mm -hmm. So I went to guide school after college, and they also encouraged me to apply to work in the fly shop at Henry's Fork Anglers on, in Idaho. So I worked there for a season, and after that decided that I wanted to be a full-time fishing guide and found a job offer to go to Alaska. So I got it in King Salmon, Alaska, on the Nackanick River in the Bristol Bay region for a season. But I really missed Yellowstone and this whole area. So I returned, worked in another fly shop, bought a drift boat, and took everybody floating and fishing that wanted to go until I ended up making contact through friends with the Firehole Ranch here in West Yellowstone. And they had a job opening for the following summer, and I ended up getting a guide job working there. So I guided full-time at the Firehole for 11 seasons. I had the opportunity to apply for and get my outfitter's license in Montana in 2004, which I did. So then I worked at the fire hole as a guide and was their Montana outfitter for the last four seasons that I worked there. In 2012, I decided to leave the ranch and go out on my own and run my own business. So I'm full-time Riverside Anglers guiding on the Madison River outside of Yellowstone National Park and then also wade fishing trips inside Yellowstone National Park. Wow, quite the portfolio, quite the uh, the list of people that you've uh, been introduced to along the way. Very, very impressive. Alice, I did want to ask you, what, when you're guiding in uh, Yellowstone, what is the species that you're primarily targeting? Well, we don't have one species that we're targeting. So we are lucky enough with the huge variety of water in the Yellowstone region. We have some rivers that the fire, like the Firehole River and the Madison inside Yellowstone that the rainbow trout and brown trout do well in and then higher elevation streams 
are host to our native Yellowstone cutthroat. And then we also have West Slope cutthroat and Snake River cutthroat. And of course, mountain whitefish. Definitely cool. Alice, now, I know there's um, some conservation issues circling around the, the Yellowstone. Is there, is there anything you can talk about today? Absolutely. Uh, I think a lot of anglers are probably familiar with the story about Yellowstone Lake with the lake trout that have been introduced that have been consuming the ju- the juvenile native Yellowstone cutthroat in the upper Yellowstone River and then inside the lake. So over the course of my guide career, I've seen the decline of that population of native Yellowstone cutthroat in the upper Yellowstone River. And those fish are working their way back through Trout Unlimited and a number of other organizations that have contributed to the program. They now have uh, an entire fleet of gill netting boats that have come from the Midwest and they're out trying to net those lake trout out of Yellowstone Lake. So they're trying to remove the lake trout to help encourage the cutthroat to come back. And personally, I feel like we'll see this recovery of this population once we see a variety of age classes of the Yellowstone cutthroat in that upper Yellowstone River drainage. Mm -hmm. I personally, um, I go fish there on occasion and very rarely do I guide over there. I take a few clients and I explain to them that the population is pretty low and the best thing we can do is not to stress out those older mature fish that I think have the opportunity to pass on their genes and, and help restore that population. So I'm pretty insistent on, you know, telling folks what to, what's to be expected for the day. If we do fish to those fish and we do find one, they do not come out of the water. You know, photos are taken with the fish in the net in the water and they're released immediately. Of course, all of our flies are barbless, but definitely doing our best to release those cutthroats. The farther down the system, there are rainbow trout that are also coming up from the lower end and they are in the Lamar River. And so they're doing other conservation efforts to try to protect those cutthroat and keep them genetically pure so that there's no hybridization from the rainbows. The challenge for us as anglers is that it's bear country. And so killing rainbow trout when you're in the woods is a safety risk. And so I would like to see the Park Service bring back the volunteer angler program. I personally would definitely volunteer to go catch some rainbows to have them removed from the system. But that's the current plan is to ask anglers to remove rainbows from the Lamar River system to protect those cutthroats. Oh, it's a consensus. This is super important to you as a guide, as an angler, as a business owner, as as a, a Montana resident. What are some other things that Montana residents can do to uh, help in this regards? You know, the Park Service has put in some rules on not wearing felt in our national in Yellowstone National Park, mm-hmm. and I think it's important to to clean your gear and, and pay attention to that. We live at the headwaters of several major sources of water for this whole country in this region. And so not wearing felt, cleaning, draining your boat, not moving invasive species and stagnant water from one place to the next to the next could, could help that tremendously. And then in the middle of our summer, when it's, it's hot out, um, keeping those fish in the river, you know, hook a fish, Barbless, hopefully, unhook it, let it go. You know, take the photos close to the water if you can. Just think about how high you're holding that fish out of the water and how much you're expecting it to basically hold its breath is uh, is important. I think it's fish need to be treated with a lot of respect because we spend a lot of time and effort to go out and catch them and enjoy the places they live. Yeah, hundred percent agree with you. Plus, I'd, just to follow that up, if you do have one, like to play it properly, not maybe not stress it out so much is something I would uh, throw in there as well. So go ahead, Alice. No, I totally agree. Like appropriately sized gear for where you're fishing and doing your best to get that fish in as quickly as possible is the most responsible way to ensure its survivability. Perfect. You know what? Let's talk about gear. So when you're, when you're out uh, guiding, what are you, what are you setting clients up with? I encourage my clients to fish with a five weight. Um, personally, I fish with a nine foot five weight and I, I'm always fishing with a Winston because I enjoy the Winston feel, but Mm -hmm. the nine foot five weight fly rod works out of the drift boat. And then I think it's also appropriately sized for any of the fish that we're going to find walkway fishing in Yellowstone National Park. And most of the time we're fishing with a floating line and I'm a big fan 
of the amplitude smooth, either the infinity or the trout taper, those work fantastic for our fishing, whether we're fishing with nymphs under an indicator or swinging soft tackles or fishing dry flies. Alice, tell me a, a situation, a very challenging situation brought with a guiding client in the backcountry uh, fishing for cutthroat. Well, there's a number of great spots that we can hike to in Yellowstone National Park. So without revealing specific destinations, uh, in the in August, most of the time, once our waters come down out of runoff and it has come to a very manageable level where we have consistent temperatures, bugs are hatching, fish are happy, and we want to go fish to them, there, we frequently are trying to target hatches. And these, it can be uh, PMDs, could be caddis, could be some small stone flies. Certainly we fish a fair number of terrestrials when we can. Ants, beetles, and hoppers are always in the box. But if I can find fish that are rising to a hatch and to a specific bug that's emerging, it, I personally find it very rewarding. And I think most of my clients really enjoy it. Because you just get to see it all happening. Mm -hmm. You know, they see the bugs on the water. They see the fish rising. Hopefully, we've been able to spot some fish, too, in the water. And I just feel like that is, like, the number one thing to be doing, personally. That's what I really enjoy, and I, I try to instill that in my clients. So, that water, though, can be, especially towards the middle of the end of the summer, can be pretty low. The fish have been fished through a few times, maybe. The water is a little bit lower and very flat. And so, again, kind of back to the conservation a little bit, I personally try not to fish fluorocarbon very often. I like to keep it with the nylon monofilament. And we're lucky enough in this area that usually a 9-foot 5X leader is perfectly suitable to these dry fly scenarios, unless we're fishing a bigger fly, and then I might fish uh, 4X or even 3X, hopefully, mm -hmm. with a hopper. To get it to turn over but that nine foot four x five x liter and then being able to use the new absolute trout tippet has been a huge improvement for me i was always nervous fishing six x yeah going back to that responsible landing of fish potentially then breaking it off and they set the hook i mean it's kind of a build up to that moment when that fish is rising to eat that tiny dry fly they finally make a reach cast that's going to work. We get the fly into where the fish is. You see the fish moving. They're about to eat it. And then you really hope that they don't whip it or snap the fly off. And so I found a big difference in the stronger wet knot strength of that absolute tippet in that I can get away with fishing 5X to places where the fish previously, I really had to be using 6X in that one scenario. So you know, 10, 12 foot leader might be necessary in some of those scenarios, but I'm happy that I can use 5X a little bit in that. And I know the East Coast anglers are all laughing because the thought of fishing 5 or 6X just seems like fishing rope. But <laughs> 7X and 8X is just not necessary out here. And I'm okay with that. I hear you. It sounds like you've done really well with, with scientific anglers. I know you're an ambassador for them as well. And you actually had some hands-on uh, experience developing or prototype helping with this absolute. Walk us through that a bit. Yeah, it's a fantastic product. And I uh, was given the opportunity to fish some of the tippet during this past summer when I knew I was going to have some of these scenarios with some pickier fish and slower waters and, and being able to put clients on that, on those fishing scenarios and then try out the tippet. And so I was, I've been very happy with the tippet and then I'm using the, I like the fact that there's both clear and the stealth green. Mm -hmm. So I've been using stealth green, like I said, in that 5X quite a bit for some of those pickier fish and kind of spring creek scenarios. And I did a bit of fishing and guiding on the spring creeks in Montana this summer also. And really enjoyed using some of that on my own when I was fishing, not just when I was guiding, but the clear has been fantastic for my nymph rig setups. If I'm floating the Madison or early and late season in the park. And personally, all the tippet companies and everything that I've used over the years guiding. One thing that drives me crazy is um, I actually like the three X and the four X to have a little bit of stiffness to them. And I don't necessarily want to go to Maxima, but I would like something that's got a bit of stiffness. And I find that there's some 4X tippets out there and 3X that just are way too supple. And so 
having that rigidity, if you will, and that stronger tippet has been fantastic for setting up nymph rigs and, and knowing that the flies are going to be hopefully where I think they are when they get down there. Cool. You know, Alice, there's, there's something else that I want to touch base with you on, and that's the how successful you are at with uh, Riverside Angling. And it's because you're doing stuff different. And it, is it a teaching aspect that you're bringing into uh, to your guiding for your clients? Walk us through that. Yes. I, I feel like my years of experience in this area in summer and winter, so in addition to guiding fishing in the summertime, I also guide snow coach trips into Yellowstone in the wintertime. So I drive a snow coach in and give an interpretive tour and also guide cross-country skiing trips. And I use a lot of that material in my summer fishing trips, if you will. And I think it's part of being a guide personally that I give them the whole picture. You know, I'm, I don't have all day to necessarily tell them all about the wolf pack that was in that area, but I give them a pretty good background of the geology and the history and the culturally significant spots and different things that have occurred in the area that we're going to be fishing. So I feel like I bring that big picture um, education to the spot, but I also work with folks on their fishing. And so I try not to put them into situations that are going to be impossible to achieve, but I also am also look, I'm always looking at their fishing as an educational opportunity. So I try to work with folks on their casting reading water, figuring out where the fish are. You know, we kind of come up with a game plan maybe before we get to the river. And then once we get there and we see the scenario, we can kind of talk about where we're going. And my goal is to help them improve their fishing or their skills in general that they can take back to wherever they're fishing, not just when they're fishing in this area. So I'm always looking at an opportunity to help folks with their technique, their technique and their casting and give them a few tips and things that are going to help them be successful here and will apply to the rest of their fly fishing destinations. Hey, Alice, I'm going to put you on the spot right now, and uh, I'm going to ask you for a couple tips for our podcast listeners out there. Um, What are a couple tips that you personally would suggest if someone was to fish in uh, the Yellowstone? I think doing some research is important before you get here. Uh, We have a specific season, if you will, for fishing in this area. And not everything fishes well through the entire season. So knowing early or late in the season, fishing a little bit lower elevation, middle of the season, fishing at higher elevation, you know, set yourself up for success to be able to find fish that are feeding and and hatches that are happening. So a little research helps. And then research specifically to the spot that you're going. So you have an idea of the fish that you're fishing to or the type of water you're going to be in. And then once you get there, you know, I am, I, walk pretty slowly to the river once I'm on the water just to try to make as many observations of what's going on around me as I can, whether that's what the birds are doing as far as the osprey or the eagles, or do I see fish rising or do I see bugs and being able to kind of get folks positioned appropriately for that. And I specifically fish well Yellowstone's rules are that you and this whole area Yellowstone and Montana that you can't fish more than two flies and so I'm fishing two flies if I'm nymphing or swinging soft tackles but when we're dry fly fishing I'm always trying to fish a single fly and try to target a particular insect or a fish that's rising if we can my goal is to make that fly, of course, visible for my clients. And so a couple of tips that I have, I always carry some small Sharpies with me. And I have a black or a brown Sharpie, and then I have a red or a magenta pink Sharpie with me. Sometimes I need to t- color up flies and change up their color a little bit but for the underneath. But it also may be the top. And so I might need to be coloring up that post or part of the wing. I may even trim flies a bit to make mm-hmm. them float well so fish so the clients can see them and the fish can see them. But I do that so that I'm not fishing two flies because I feel like some of the water that we fish has too many little microcurrents and seams and one fly is going to make that second fly drag, whether it's a nymph or a dry fly. And I would rather see one dry fly out there with good drift. That's going to catch more fish, in my opinion, than poorly presented flies. It always does, doesn't it? Always does. Yeah. A, a well-positioned fly, for sure. You know, Alice, if someone wanted to book a trip with you, where would they go to? My website is riversideanglers.com, 
And I'm also on Instagram and Facebook under the same name, Riverside Anglers. And you're now taking bookings for the for the 2020 season. Yes, I am. Yep, this is the season. I'm giving a few presentations at clubs. I've been to a few fly fishing shows this season. Nice. And I'm taking bookings for guide trips for the 2020 season. I also have some women's fly fishing schools that I'm teaching this summer and a few one-day on-the-water clinics that we're booking. Where, where so, are the, really quickly, where are, the, the time. where are those women's uh, fly fishing schools? They're uh, based out of West Yellowstone. Okay. And we're going to either be on the Madison River outside of the park or we may be on a few of the rivers inside of the park. Kind of depends on conditions mm-hmm. and where the best fishing is at the time. And all that will be available on your website as well. Is that correct? Yes. Perfect. I'm going to make sure I put that in the show notes so so that if anyone's interested, they can definitely reach out to you on all the levels that you've just mentioned. So, Alice, I want to thank you for being a guest on Guided today. So thank you very much for being a guest. You guys, the listeners, thank you guys for listening. I appreciate your time, Greg. Thanks for having me. No worries. You've been listening to the Guided Podcast, sponsored by Scientific Anglers. If you like this podcast episode, please let us know and leave a review on your favorite podcast listening platform. And remember, subscribe to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast to get even more episodes of both Guided and the Fly Fishing Insider each week. See more at flyfishinginsiderpodcast.com.